on speed news. We cover the rules on passing, NASA club members who moved up to the pro ranks, and a nasty crash in Sonoma. Welcome to Speed News, the National Auto Sport Association's video news magazine, with hosts Rob Kreider and John Lindsay, joined by an ever-changing group of NASA members and staff. Speed News keeps you up to date on all of the happenings around the NASA motorsports world. Because at NASA, we drive harder. Welcome to the June 2012 edition of Speed News. I'm your host, Rob Kreider. At my side, as always, is my facial-haired friend, John Lindsay, NASA's Chief Divisional Director. And this month, we have a guest host, Ryan Flaherty, NASA's National Chairman. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks, Rob. And John, how are you doing today? How is that uh, Volkswagen Beetle on steroids of a Porsche you have there? Well, you know, ironically, it's running, Rob. I uh, was uh, messing around with the idle speed the other day, and I, uh, well, I took a lot of stuff apart and, of course, couldn't put it back together right and discovered uh, that about $6 worth of gaskets were keeping it from running at all. So uh, once I got those buttoned up and uh, corrected my ham-fisted mistakes with a couple of helicoils and some uh, red Loctite, we were good to go again. So, uh, yeah, the Beetle is running. So now the Porsche is good to go, you can actually maybe pass somebody with it, right? I don't know, Rob. I, uh, I drive like an old lady, so I think I'll just stick <laughs> in the, uh, the minivan lane for now. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, passing is actually the first thing we're going to talk about today. Uh, one of the most important things about motorsports, obviously, to win a race is you probably need to get around the guy in front of you. Now, Ryan, both you and John have, have had the, uh, the pleasure of listening to people discuss what happens when those passings don't go well, and they're involved in some contact. Now, John, tell me about this other guy I've heard about in racing. Well, Rob, on the NASA contact forms, what you see is this little place where you can select who is at fault, either me or the other guy. Uh, and in all of my years as a race director, I think I've seen maybe four or five times out of hundreds of contacts reports where it says the, uh, the, that I was at fault and not this other guy. So I've spent about 10 years looking for the other guy and I have never been able to find him. He's <laughs> like the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, the whole nine yards there. Right. Ryan, how about you? Have you met anybody who was actually the other guy? As John said, it's, it's a rare occasion. So uh, that's sort of the ongoing joke at the racetrack is who is this other guy? It's great to bring a stack of body contact reports to the driver's meeting and the race director flip through it 10 times and say, the other guy, the other guy, the other guy. So, you know, we try to drive a point home that uh, it's really impossible that uh, all the racing that you do, you don't have any type of fault in uh, a particular incident. And we just ask people to really uh, be prudent and drive safely. And if something happens, take responsibility for it. Now, the NASA CCRs are pretty specific in the rules of passing in determining fault. And we're going to show a couple of diagrams here, and it deals with the article in Speed News last month showing who is at fault in a certain type of situation. So when you look at figure A here, we're looking at a basic turn, and we're going to talk about the racing line, because the racing line comes up a lot in uh, these passing situations where someone says, oh, the person cut down on me or not. So figure A basically shows a, uh, a green Mustang going through the racing line, and that's the same line he's always going to take. Now, figure B shows a situation where a, uh, an orange car here, a Camaro, and we use the Camaro Mustang Challenge example because these guys like to run into each other quite a bit. Wouldn't you agree, John? Oh, I don't know, Rob. I don't think that's completely fair. They, uh, they're usually pretty clean uh, from what I've seen. And, uh, <laughs> of course, you don't want to get the hate mail from the CMC guys. So, uh, <laughs> you know, every now and then there's a little contact. But when you have a good uh, close bunch of spec racing, sometimes there's a little, uh, little rubbing. So, you know, rubbing can be racing. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, we look at figure B. Now, we're showing the Mustang here is going through the same racing line, but the Camaro is basically trying to sneak in. Now, at the moment the Camaro is approaching the turn, he thinks, hey, this guy's leaving the door wide open for me, when realistically, the, the green Mustang's going through the racing line. And then as they reach the apex, the Mustang takes his normal racing line, he touches the Camaro and the front fender with the rear fender of the Mustang, and then, boom, the Camaro driver says, the phrase that pays, he chopped me off, he cut me off. Have you guys ever heard that before? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the very typical response. And like you said, Rob, you have to expect the driver in front of you to run a consistent line. And the rules state that the overtaking driver has the responsibility to make a clean pass. And as this diagram depicts, you need to have your front bumper equal 
to the driver that's seated in the car ahead of you in order to have what the CCR defines as the right to the line. And clearly in this particular uh, diagram, he does not. So the overtaking driver would be at fault. Now this segues us right to the next one, and that is the uh, figure C. And that figure now, this Camaro driver actually gets it done a lot earlier and does exactly what Ryan says. He's got the front bumper showing next to the Mustang driver, actual driver's passenger door, where the driver can see that that car is there and there's gonna be a conflict. And in figure C, we see, hey, he got it done early. And then the Mustang driver concedes. And now we have a clean, safe pass. Everyone makes it through the corner without any bent sheet metal. So in figure D, we're gonna show another version of the, of the figure B pass. And this deals with um, multi-class racing. And when you have uh, different classes at different speeds, that really causes a lot of conflict in the track. It makes racing a lot of fun. But a lot of times you see a situation like we'll show here in figure D where you have two cars, we've got a couple of Hondas, they're racing in maybe uh, PTE and uh, or Honda Challenge, and then up comes a faster car, maybe racing in PTA, that sees the opportunity to pass these two slower cars because really they're just in his way, correct? Well, in his mind, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in his mind, yes, yes. The faster cars, that's the real race. These other guys, I don't know what they're doing out there. They're just in his way, right? <laughs> sure, that's so, the uh, sometimes the mindset we see. Yeah, exactly. So in this figure here, he sees the opportunity, he can pass the first car and get a clean pass done, but then he says, same thing, that, that second car that doesn't even see him coming because his rearview mirror is filled with the slow car that's been following him around for lap after lap. Suddenly, he goes down to the apex, the racing line, and gets taken out by the faster car, and of course, the faster car will say the same thing. He cut me off, came down on me, and, uh, and carnage ensues. And then they sit, uh, they fill out their form, and they sit down with you, John, and then uh, the excuses start to fly, don't they? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but usually uh, we really encourage all of our drivers to run video uh, so we can have an absolute account of what happened. Uh, the GoPro units have gotten so affordable now that there's really no excuse not to run one. So that is usually a deciding factor for me. Uh, I had a great experience at the, uh, well, I don't know if it was great, but uh, I had my uh, AI drivers. I was the uh, race director for that national championship race and one of the qualifying races we had 17 out of 21 ai entrants pass under yellow and the Ooh. thing that got me out of the soup was where i had a video from one of the guys that was in the very back and it showed everybody passing under yellow uh, including one gentleman who shall remain nameless who was just absolutely adamant that he had not passed under yellow and when I showed it to him uh, on a big screen in a hauler, about 15, 20 minutes later, his tone really changed. So, eh, it happens, but we really try to uh, work it out in the most fair and equitable manner. And the video does really help with that. Ryan, any advice for competitive drivers trying to make that last second pass? Yeah, I, I definitely. We try to, we try to uh, instill in all our drivers that uh, you definitely can't win a race in the first lap and a lot of contact we see. Uh, ironically happens in the first half of the race and um, you know the only way you can get it done is being smooth and consistent and that really uh, goes into passing as well if you don't if you're not sure you can get the pass done you may want to wait to another corner to get that assurance that you're going to get the clean pass done so you can get to the front and actually win the race great advice i hope everyone watching takes it because uh, racing is all about adrenaline, but sometimes you got to calm down and make sure we get through things safely. Well, in most cases, yeah, Rob, but uh, I have a short video clip here that might show a driver that's not so calm. <laughs> uh, can we roll that video clip, please? Car. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. All right? got hit. This is I don't need it. All right? Pay attention to what you're What the You're going to kill somebody. You're lucky I don't have my rear tire. Yeah, I think I recognize that, uh, but I don't recall it. Doesn't ring a bell. Wow, you sound just like Oliver North. I can't recall that episode, Senator, but it uh, kind of looks like you, Rob, or your twin brother with the uh, same racing suit I've seen you in. So, you know, man, I, I really recommend maybe a little, you know, anger management and really looking inside and being a little more zen when you're in the paddock there, buddy. Okay, all right, fair enough. It wasn't my greatest moment at the racetrack. I, I could give you a million excuses about why that happened, but uh, hey, man, I guess the tape doesn't lie, and that's why maybe you better, better wait, watch who's, uh, who's filming you before you go running in the paddock to have a little tiff. 
Cameras are everywhere. Exactly. All right, well, that takes us to our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the NASA drivers who've gone from the club ranks up to the pro racing ranks. State your desires. Speed. Adrenaline. Competition. Calculating. Result in three, two, one. The National Auto Source Association. Start here. Welcome back to Speed News. A lot of drivers in NASA have a lot of aspirations about moving up from the club ranks to the pro ranks, and a lot of NASA drivers have actually already done it. And we're going to talk about three of those drivers today. We had a feature in the June issue of Speed News Magazine. So, Ryan, who did you choose to talk about? Rob, I would uh, like to talk about Don Gardner. He's been with us for a very long time. He's one of our success stories. He's one of the individuals that really went through the HPD ladder program. He started in HPD, actually then went through a uh, time trial, secured a national championship in time trial in 2006 at our first national championship, quickly moved into the racing world and uh, uh, secured three national championships in performance touring after that. So uh, this guy's got a lot of championships under his belt. He's also a avid endurance racer and has won two regional endurance championships out in the West. And, um, was running, as a matter of fact, uh, captured third place in class in the 25-hour at Thunder Hill last year, but uh, remarkably was also running in first place in the 25-hour for 22 hours prior to a mechanical failure. So the guy knows how to get the job done. He has a good team as well. I saw that race, and he actually, they did a complete motor swap and got back out and took the checkered flag, which was very impressive at that race. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, this, this guy uh, really has worked hard in the NASA world and, and quickly moved into the pro ranks. He was one of the first individuals that uh, drove a Scion branded car in a professional racing series. The first race he went out was with Grand Am. The uh, following year went to World Challenge and uh, captured a manufacturer's championship for Toyota. And that was the first that's been done in uh, more than a 20 year history. So the guy uh, transitions easily to the pro ranks and definitely makes a name for himself there as well. Very impressive. Now, John, who did you choose to talk about today? Well, Rob, my choice was Ryan Ellis. And Ryan is a young man, he's only 22 years old. And he started racing when he was four years old, if you can believe that. Uh, I. Just uh, really admire how he kept at it. He started off in uh, little quarter midgets and came up through the Legends ranks. Uh, he's been in stock cars, sports cars, all kinds of things, and just really a motivated young man. I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, once at the Hyperfest event over in our Mid-Atlantic region. And he was, had himself very together, and he was even younger then. This was in 2008, so still a very young guy. Had his wits very much about it. Unfortunately, I was talking to him when he had a penalty situation where there was a yellow flag pass, but he was very mature already at that time. And he's gone on to have great success. He was in the VW TDI Cup, and he's raced with us and had great success with us in our Team Miata Challenge uh, that Mazda has put together and really has excelled. And now he is driving. He also was at the 2011 NASA National Championships and he won the Super Unlimited class and is the factory driver for super light cars with their SLC coupe that is just an awesome machine and he blew everybody away in Super Unlimited at the championships this year. Won that, he was also the 2011 Grand Am uh, ST class rookie of the year and he landed himself a ride this year with iMoto uh, driving a Mazda Speed 3 and he's doing great in ST, struggling a little bit, I noticed, in his last couple of events, but he did notch a win at Homestead. That was before he got into Mazda. That was in a 128i. But Ryan, I think, is a really great example of how NASA helps young drivers to develop and really excel in the pro ranks. And I see big things for him coming up. Well, speaking of young drivers, I chose a young driver as well. I chose Elliot Skier. Had the opportunity to interview him, actually, at last year's 25 Hours of Thunder Hill, where he was driving to Mazda 2. Now, Elliot has raced Spec Miata and PTE with NASA, and uh, he's only 17 years old. And he won the, NASA, uh, the uh, Mazda Teen Challenge and moved up to the Pro Series. Now he's actually racing the Playboy MX-5 Cup 
Ironically, uh, at 17 years old, he's actually not even old enough to purchase a Playboy magazine. <laughs> but uh, in his third <laughs> professional race, Poor guy. he found a way to win. Actually, he won at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. And uh, I'm sure they got Playboy girls all around there. But uh, like I said, he's not old enough to actually buy the magazine that those girls are in. So, But uh, when I had the chance to talk with him, what I was really impressed about Elliot was he was so polished. I mean, this guy's wearing his Mazda sh uh, Speed shirt. Uh, he mentioned Mazda during the interview. I mean, he's 17 years old. When I was 17 years old, I wasn't doing anything that professional by any means. In fact, we can't even discuss what I was doing uh, because it's so unprofessional. But uh, <laughs> this kid has it together, you know, and so it's impressive and uh, that he's a NASA club racer and, and making his way up. And at 17 years old, has already won a professional race. I think it's very cool. Yeah, Elliot's definitely a rising star. We expect uh, to see great things from him. But, you know, he's really a product of uh, an incredible motorsports program put together by Mazda. And we should spend a few minutes talking about that. You know, uh, they have a driver search every single year in order to put somebody like Elliot in a MX-5 cup car for the season. And uh, incidentally, Elliot was a product of uh, getting that ride by winning that driver search because he won the NASA Team Challenge. Now, the year prior to that, we also had an individual by the name of Scott Shelton, who was also running the MX-5 in the previous year, and he won that driver search by way of winning a national championship in performance touring. So the last two years, uh, two NASA drivers won that uh, prestigious battle to get that pro ride. So we're, we're very pleased with that. And uh, you, you, can't, you can't praise Mazda more for their commitment to motorsports. They just really have a solid program. No, it's a fantastic program. And now we're seeing more and more NASA drivers make it through the pro ranks. And NASA is a huge part of that as well as Mazda as well. And that takes us to our next commercial break. We come back, we're going to talk about a, a pretty ugly crash and how someone used some great safety equipment to survive that crash. Welcome to another episode of Racing No Filter. Joining me in sunny California, Bill Wood, and down in sunny Florida, Peter Keen. We're going to take a look at some of the products HPD has created for the 2012 Honda Civic. And specifically, we're going to show you an install and adjustable sway bar. Until then, folks out there, you take care. Want to keep up with all the racing action at the track? Well, download the new Go Racing TV iPhone and Android app. And remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Welcome back to Speed News. One of the articles we ran in the June issue of Speed News magazine is one of a pretty good crash over at Sonoma or Infineon Raceway, whatever they're calling it this week. And uh, John, why don't you talk about what happened out there? Well, Rob, this was a really, really scary crash. It was a result of one racer not waiting to make a pass, just like we talked about in the first segment. What we had was Jerry Amani races a really nice, uh, well, raced, I guess, in the past tense because the car was destroyed in the wreck. She has a spec Miata that she also runs a performance touring, and she was coming into the S's there at, at Sears Point, and she was motoring along and noticed a faster Camaro Mustang Challenge car coming up behind her and figured that he would motor on by and uh, gave him a little bit of room as I understand things and just kept driving her line and was just going right along and he managed to touch the rear of that car at a pretty high rate of speed where the car was already getting a little loose because of the cornering and it sent Jerry right into the tires and the car went into the tires did a full gainer landed on the roof and it just absolutely destroyed the car and it was a really scary crash but the upshot of it was that Every piece of safety equipment in the car did its job. Uh, she had a really stout cage, really, really good seat in there, a good uh, state-of-the-art seat, belts. Of course, the head and neck requirement or the he required head and neck uh, restraint equipment that we've required for quite a long time. And she walked away. By the time the safety crew got there, she got her bell rung a little bit, but she had her wits about her. And a few minutes later was walking around the paddock looking at the damaged car. So I guess the takeaway is, is that the safety equipment and the, what could have been a horrendous crash, and if you would have looked at this crash 10 years ago with the technology that was available then, uh, no head and neck require, requirements or even the equipment wasn't available, and you see some really horrible results that could happen with some big injuries, but 
with how good the modern equipment is, it was a non-issue and she was walking around and the only damage was a busted car. So, uh, Rob, I understand you have some in-car video uh, that we can look at. Yeah, correct. Actually, this crash, we have two different videos. We have one from outside near the S's there at uh, Sears Point, and we have one from the in-car camera, which is actually going to be this month's GoPro Hero Move of the Month. And uh, But the first one we're going to show here is going to be actually outside of the S's here. So as we watch the video, you're going to see a few spec Miatas or PTE Miatas go by, and they're really only going to kind of catch the tail end as this thing is doing the, uh, what was that uh, move, the Triple Lindy, I think it was called in that movie, Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield? She finishes up the Triple Lindy there and, uh, and lands uh, on, her, on, her, on her actual wheels, which is pretty impressive. Now, secondarily, we have the inside video here. This is our GoPro move of the month. And uh, you can see her going through the S's and Infineon, and everything is going pretty good. And uh, she's minding her own business, feeling good, looking good. And then, oh, there it is. It's that, that sick feeling. We've all been there as racers. Where, and then the glass breaks. The, that noise that you hear when you get hit from the back, and it just sends you into that rotation. It's just the worst, worst feeling. And, uh, and that's certainly what happened to her here. Uh, probably the scariest part of the video is when you see ground sky, ground sky, and then that rear glass just completely breaks out. You know, a uh, pretty awful deal. Now, Ryan, when you see a crash video like that, a lot of times uh, it's exciting to watch, but... Uh, do people see that and get an idea that motorsports is dangerous? Yeah, definitely. You know, you, you, I'm sure you as well get questions from non-racers all the time. Man, how do you, how can you race because it's so dangerous? And I think the answer is, is I don't think personally it's any more dangerous than driving to work in the morning. The reality is, is the safety equipment in a race car works. The head and neck restraint, the containment seats, the nets, the size of the tubing. Everything together really, really provides a v big envelope of protection. And uh, we're very fortunate that crashes like the one that we just saw, drivers can walk away without uh, anything more than a little bit of headache that a uh, aspirin can solve. I agree. And that wraps up our episode here of Speed News. If you want to send in your video to be part of the GoPro Hero Move of the Month, send that video link to speednews at drivenasa.com. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you, John. And we'll see you next month here on GoRacingTV.com.